Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Curtis, and I'm one of the paleontologists here at Fossil Crates. And today, I have the unbelievably good fortune to speak with one of the most dynamic up-and-coming paleontologists that you're ever going to meet, Emily Keeble. So without further ado, can you tell us who you are, where you're at, what you're studying? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm currently working on, um, with the Dawn Dinos Project uh, at the Royal Veterinary College uh, in London. Uh, and this project is looking at the locomotor superiority hypothesis. So we are looking to test uh, whether dinosaurs basically had a locomotory advantage over other archosaurs. And this is why we see them flourish at the end Triassic and uh, into the Jurassic, whereas Pseudosuchians in particular decline uh, a lot. And we're doing this by making uh, rigorous biomechanical musculoskeletal models um, digitally. Uh, and we're going to plug in a bunch of uh, stuff and uh, see what the uh, computer spits back out once we've done that. <laughs> uh, more complicated than that, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. So is the punchline there, you're testing stance, the erect stance versus the sprawled stance, and then are you looking at open acetabulum versus closed acetabulum? Yeah, that's one thing we're looking at posture, um, but we're also looking at things like gait. So uh, in addition to just having the skeleton and looking at how that stands, we've also got data from living animals. So uh, looking at uh, the Nile crocodile and the Tinamou, uh, a small ground dwelling bird uh, in particular, as our sort of extant um, models uh, in order to see how they're moving. And then if we can get our models to recreate their movement, we can sort of validate our extinct animal models and see uh, if we're coming up with reasonable assumptions on how they would have moved um, in addition to just the, gate, uh, the, um, the stance. Can you talk to me about your work in the computers? Because you are uh, a 3D digital paleontologist based on some of the publications I work, some amazing illustrations and fantastic, just, I don't know, you can't call them, what do you call them? Art, graphics, um, drawing? <laughs> yeah, mo models usually, because uh, okay. they're, um, they are, basically scans of the real fossils. Uh, so CT scans uh, and occasionally um, surface scans, depending on what I'm working on. Um, yeah, uh, put them in uh, the software and then from just having those CT scans, we can separate or I can separate out the individual bones and move them about and get a nice uh, clear image of what this thing would have looked like in three dimensions, um, which is really cool. Uh, something that technology has allowed us to do in the last decade or so. Uh, but yeah, it's becoming more and more of a, uh, an interesting and exciting tool that we can use to study these extinct animals. Were you always inclined on the IT side of your interest or how did you end up in dinosaurs and how did you merge the future of technology with deep past? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've pretty much always been interested in dinosaurs, but um, the IT st uh, side of stuff uh, came later during my master's degree. Um, when I was looking at uh, small fissure fill sediments, so um, fissures in rocks, uh, and then later a, lo a load of sediment came in there. And with this sediment, we get these small animals um, preserved. Most of them are jumbled up, just isolated elements because they've been washed in there by water. Um, but occasionally you get something that's clearly washed in as one thing or a large chunk of a thing at the very least. Um, and we had one of these in a very, it was a very, very fragile specimen. So we didn't want to prepare it out uh, and uh, risk losing the articulation that it had because it would have had to be done by acid. And it was, it was difficult. We, we just didn't want to risk that. Uh, so we decided to stick it in the CT scanner um, instead. Uh, and it came back really, really nice. And that was the first time that I got to do, do um, any digital paleontology work like, properly. Um, uh, and yeah, it was, it was great and I enjoyed it. And uh, it's, just, it's just kept coming up in my work again, and again, and again. Um, so I, I guess now it's kind of my thing. <laughs> that is fantastic. And you mentioned acid wash. So you've done some, prep, some preparation in your time, I take it. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first um, experience I had with prep. So other other specimens from those fissure fills, we did use acid to, to prep them out. Or we took these huge big blocks of matrix. I dunked them in an acid bath overnight, wash them off the next day, dunk them in a bath of water, leave that for another day. And then you come back and pick through all the sediment. And this went on. Um, and I did this for several months um, <laughs> before we got through all the material. <laughs> Uh, and um, it's great. It, it gets you some nice specimens. Um, I think I had over a thousand little tiny bits and pieces to go through in the end, but you do end up smelling like vinegar. 
uh, for several months, um, I would say. <laughs> for those that know me, vinegar is one of my most hated and loathed flavors. So yeah, I, uh, I had to do some acid wash way back in the day and discovered that it wasn't going to work for me. The smell alone was going to kill me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely not, not definitely not for everyone. <laughs> but, but the images, like uh, some of the teeth that you were able to, to produce from that, you want to talk about some of those? Because what was the genus they belong to? And um, most of the uh, teeth and most of the bones and bit species that we recovered were from uh, Clevisaurus, and, and um, a new species that we actually discovered, Clevisaurus cambrica, um, as a part of that. Uh, that that's what the majority of material was from. And occasionally we'd or we'd find, or I'd find um, uh, different bits and pieces. So we also had some material from um, uh, a, di a dinosaur called Pantidraco. Uh, that was a very exciting day when I found, we found two teeth on that. And I'd spent the whole day just picking out her bone fragment number 683 bone fragment number 684 and then suddenly the next like slide I looked at or the next like little chunk of matrix I looked at there were these two perfect teeth I was like I know exactly what those are <laughs> it was brilliant just really really typical sort of leaf shaped teeth um exactly like knew exactly what it was the moment I saw it that is so awesome uh, the very first fossil I found in the Jurassic was an allosaurus tooth and I hit a rock pulled it over and there it was and it's just that moment of and I'm the first person seeing this in 150 yes. million years. And there it is. And it's that sense of just amazing, uh, I don't know, spirituality. And, and, yeah. and I don't really know what else to call it. Yeah, I, I really love that about prep, that you're, you're the first person uncovering this and the first person to see this uh, ever. And that's a really exciting thing for me. That's one of the main reasons I really love preparing fossils. So you like dinosaurs as a small child as well? Yeah, previous. yeah. I was I was a dino kid. My bedroom back at my parents' house is painted with dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> box full of dinosaur toys. All, all everything is. Yeah, <laughs> I was definitely a dino kid. Um, but my path to paleontology sort of took a wiggle. So I was like about four years old when I decided I was going to be a paleontologist. Um, <laughs> but from there, I took a, I had other interests and I decided, oh, maybe maybe I'll go off and uh, maybe I'll be an actor. Or maybe, maybe I'll go into interior design. Uh, maybe I'll be a writer. Um, and it took until I was applying for university to sort of come back. I was like, actually, you know what? I was right the first time. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I went in, I went uh, to Bristol University and did um, a degree, uh, integrated masters. So four years, bachelor's, masters combined, just get one degree at the end. Um, and that was paleontology um, as my, my main subject. There's not many places you can do paleontology as a degree, but Bristol's one of them and it's a fantastic place to do it. Have you gone out in the field and dug anything up or um, sieved or architect, you know, like the, the shake trays? Very occasionally. It's, um, uh, there, there's a really big difference in culture and fieldwork between the North America and the UK and Europe. We don't have as much fieldwork, anywhere near as much. Um, in our degree, there was no required thing. We had one field trip, but it wasn't the sort of intense field work that you do over in the States. Uh, it was more, we go along the Jurassic coast and we uh, do a bit of, bit of fossil hunting, uh, break out the hammers, get some ammonites, um, and uh, learn about the geology uh, of that area, rather than we're going to we're going to go out and we're going to collect a triceratops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's very different, but I've I've had the chance to do a bit. So when I was in my masters, we went out and investigated not the exact quarry that the um, the specimens I was working on were collected from, because they were collected back from I think the fifties through to the nineties, and I got to have a look at a very similar one, um, so that was good. And since then, I've uh, visited the States a couple of times um, and we've done a bit of field work. So uh, working on an Edmontosaurus quarry, doing a bit of prospecting um, and uh, collecting. Uh, got called one day to go and collect a bit of dinosaur leg that was weathering out from a local farmer, like um, a very, very... Um, well-known family for having dinosaurs uh, weather out of their land all the time. We want to go and collect uh, what's probably a Displetosaurus leg, but it hasn't been formally identified yet. That is so cool. And what did you think of the field work? Did you enjoy being out in the wild west of the United States? Yeah, it was great. Um, 
yeah I'd, I'd really like to do some more of it in the future um and i think i'll probably get the opportunity to uh, did, <laughs> but did, um yeah did you get to drive out here on our roads uh <laughs> I, I drove one time while I was in America um, and it was the day after I arrived in the country. So I was extremely jet lagged. One of the uh, lovely women at the museum I was interning at said, oh, just take my car. You haven't got any groceries. You need to go and get some groceries. Uh, go and drive down to the, uh, the, um, the store. And so she gave me the keys to her car, jet lagged me, having never driven on the wrong side of the road. Uh, <laughs> to a place I wasn't entirely sure the location of and I didn't have any maps or anything. Um, Luckily, your, your roads are on a grid system, so it's very difficult to get lost. It's not like the UK at all. But I haven't driven out on any of the um, off-road roads, uh, sort of bits and bobs, only that one time. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a worry as well. I hadn't driven a car for a long time before I turned up as well. I think it's been <laughs> all, about half a year since I'd driven. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> So it was kind of cool. Yeah, my, my background is uh, uh, from the Natural History Museum in London. Um, oh. and, I mean, the building itself is a piece of history. It's incredible. Um, yeah. I had to sign a radiation. When I visited, I had to sign a radiation waiver because of the specimens I was working on were deemed radioactive. Is that still the case down there? Do you still require people? Uh, only, only if you're working on those specimens, I imagine. I've never worked on anything radioactive, but there are a couple of cabinets I've seen in the um, in the collections that have big radiation warnings and saying, "Do not open. Contact this person if you want to open these cabinets." Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely still some radioactive stuff in the in the dinosaur collection. Because <laughs> when you contrast that with most of the Morse information, sauropods are radioactive at some level. Yeah. So there's no no one even acknowledges it. So it was fascinating to me as a guy who had spent years just playing with radio, you know, low levels. And then I walk over to the specimens and like, wow, they take it. Maybe I should be rethinking how serious we don't take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have from, from doing some work in America and then uh, also working in the prep lab in the Natural History Museum in London. I, I'd say there's a bit of a difference. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like, for example, I would just go and they're like, oh, you, you need to be wearing a mask to do that. So, oh, oh okay. <laughs> I, I guess I'll put that on. <laughs> so talk to us about Don Dinos. You mentioned it earlier. Um, yeah, so I, the name comes from the fact that everything we're studying is in the, the Triassic, which is the dawn of the dinosaurs, the age that gave rise to dinosaurs, um, the very first uh, ones that we see. Uh, and this is a really turbulent time in Earth's history. It's coming off the back of the Permian-Triassic extinction, which is the largest extinction in the history of life. Around 95% of species were just wiped out. So coming on this really barren thing. And uh, when, when this happens in nature, we get like a big wipeout. We often see these big radiation events. Uh, and that's what we see with archosaurs. So archosaurs come onto the stage in a really big way in the Triassic. Um, but it doesn't start out with dinosaurs being the dominant uh, group. It's, it's more Pseudosuchians and other archosaurs that are uh, the main contenders in the Triassic. Um, so what we want to see is why they declined, but dinosaurs really took off at the very end of the Triassic and in the Jurassic. Um, that they're, yeah, they're dawn of the dinosaurs. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so fun. And in the last decade, heck, in the last three years, the origins of dinosaurs have effectively been rewritten. We keep pushing them back deeper and deeper in time. The characters that I used to hang my hat on 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, most of them uh, turn out to be plesiomorphic or of limited utility or you know, convergent evolution. It seems like all I can hang my hat on now is the open acetabulum. Everything else, I can, even the, the, the traditional three sacrals fuse, but then Saturnalia comes up with two. I said, oh, are you kidding me? That's a go-to character. And now it's not. So as I, I love, because it's an area that I just get my popcorn out. I, uh, I've completely accepted the fact that everything I was taught, everything that I thought I knew to be true is arguably going to be changed heavily. I don't want to say false because it's research. We search yeah. again. That's the whole thing we do is we go back and look. But it is interesting to, to see the, the beginnings being written. And it's on these, these scrappy, usually tough to get to locales with rough material. 
it, there's nothing easy about this time period. It's, it's way back in time and, and it's in geopolitically unstable places at times. And I, my hat's off to you and all of those individuals that are doing that work at the beginnings because it will really help us understand how did they supplant those the Sudasukians, which seemed to just be, they were everywhere. They were climbing in yeah. trees. They were running fast. They were big. They were, they were, how did they lose it? And then the yeah, mammals were- Of course, there's a lot of convergence between um, dinosaurs and Sudasukians. So uh, like one of the characters that you mentioned, um, it was thought that dinosaurs had this upright stance and Sudasukians were more sprawling, uh, but that's not the case now. We've got things like Poposaurus, which basically looks like a theropod dinosaur. If you were to just glance at it, you go, yeah, it's a theropod. It's got this upright bipedal stance, so walking on two legs. Um, and it, yeah, it's got that erect posture. Uh, and you get things like etosaurs, um, which are ankylosaurs before ankylosaurs were a thing. Um, it's it's really, really interesting studying these animals um, and it, looking at their similarities and differences. Does the ankle still hold true? The crotarsial, the, the ankle, the hinge? Yeah, I th I'm pretty sure the ankle holds up uh, for... Well, everything that I've worked on, definitely. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to stay with it for now because it makes me feel a little good that some of the things that I have uh, observed still hold true. But I'm a sauropod guy, so we're a totally different, you know, it's pretty much big columns. Big columns. <laughs> very, very structurally sound beasts. So a as you came through the paleo ranks and you w work through and you're out in the museums, do you work on outreach as well? Do you interact with the public in any of the roles that you're in? Yeah, yeah. So I've done a fair bit of outreach. Um, I started at Bristol University um, with the uh, Bristol Dinosaur Project, uh, which is a really cool outreach project. Uh, we'd go into schools uh, and teach them about dinosaurs. Um, in Bristol, they, they do have a dinosaur um, called Thecodontosaurus, which was discovered uh, in the city. Um, and it was the, I want to say, fourth dinosaur ever discovered. So after Iguanodon, uh, Megalosaurus, and uh, Hi Hylosaurus, yeah. Um, That'd be it, a great it, trivia so, question. What was the fourth named dinosaur? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows the first three, but the fourth, I like it. So, so, so is it mean socket tooth lizard? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, but this was a another small sauropodomorph uh, dinosaur. Um, uh, yeah, again, again from the the Triassic, um, and closely related to Pantydraco, uh, the one that came up in my master's project. Um, yeah, we go out into schools, do do talks and things, um, do workshops uh, with kids. Um, that was my first sort of real experience with outreach. Uh, since then, I've done workshops with the uh, guides. I did one, um, and probably the main thing I do now is my Instagram, where I do a lot of uh, short posts, pictures, um, psychom in that capacity, um, which uh, I I really enjoy, and um, hopefully people enjoy it as well. Uh, I have a lot of fun doing that. Uh, I know I've definitely enjoyed watching your posts and, and reading them. And I can tell you that when we featured you on our site, the response, the direct messages, not only the public messages, but the DMs on the Facebook and the Instagram side were tremendous. There was a number of fathers and mothers that came forward and said, thank you so much. Uh, I know some of them are going to be joining the the paleo portals because they want to hear if, if you're able to speak there, they're very excited to have you as a role model for women paleontologists. And it's something I never even realized that I started looking back, all the pictures are of guys digging things up. And now we have such wonderful, you know, your science is first rate. Um, and now you have, you're inspirational. You're showing that it can be done by, by girls too. And a lot of them said, my daughter is 10 and thank you so much for showing a woman doing paleontology. So you're doing a great job at that for sure. Yeah, there's there's so many fantastic women doing paleontology these days, um, but I I feel the media tends to still focus on on the guys a, a lot of the time, um, so yeah, I guess we've just got to keep pushing, uh, <laughs> show show what we can do um, because there there are there are so many women in paleontology doing fantastic work. Do you have any advice for anyone? Uh, any of the young people today, especially young women, but young men as well that may be interested in becoming a paleontologist. And do you, do you have anything you, any words you would want to share with them? Putting yourself out there is really, really important. Um, and it took me quite a long time to to figure this out. I'm I'm generally a very shy person. So it's, it's quite a struggle to put myself out there. But once I 
did start asking uh, about and getting involved with more things, more opportunities come up um, as you make these contacts. I had one point where I was working on um, the uh, ETASOR paper um, that I, I did where I'd, um, I knew I was going to America for the summer to intern um, and I quit my job uh, to have a little time to prepare and then I realized I have all this free time so I just emailed a bunch of people asking um, have you got anything uh, I could do can I help with this uh, and they all got back to me and said yes uh, <laughs> so it, it's really a case of putting yourself out there but it did mean I ended up living in a hostel for a bit working on three separate projects uh, <laughs> and commuting to London from Bristol uh, once a week uh, which is a three-hour bus ride which is fine but yeah <laughs> be careful what you ask for I guess is one of yes. the uh, <laughs> other sides yeah. of it <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe another bit of advice is don't take on too much <laughs> put yourself out there but no one to stop so Emily you've done public outreach but you also do some more formal public outreach I believe um, yeah so yeah uh, I'm currently a writer for eons uh, which is a fantastic channel on YouTube um, uh, uh, with PBS uh, PBS eons um, they do excellent videos uh, on prehistoric life and paleontology and evolution and all kinds of interesting topics like I was I was a fan long before I was a writer so it's a really good channel um, and it's been really interesting to get to write for them and really exciting um, to do that uh, um, and I have also uh, consulted and written for a couple of uh, DK books um, for the publisher Dorling Kindersley, um, which is also incredible because these were the books that I was reading as a kid, like the DK yeah. Eyewitness books defined my childhood. And now I'm writing and consulting for the same company, which is just fantastic. Uh, if, if little me could see me now. <laughs> oh, what a great phrase. That, and that is so true. <laughs> PBS Eons, how did you come across both those opportunities? Did they reach out to you based on your social media page or how did you, did, they, did you apply? Yeah, so um, Eons I applied for. Um, that, that was a yeah, fairly normal application, but I did include my social media in the application um, and it was mentioned as being a, a good thing for me because I do these little informative posts and they, they said they liked uh, the way that I did that. So that, that was really cool. And then uh, I gave them some sample pitches because as a writer, you're also pitching the episodes. So it, you're not given a topic, you you think up the topic, um, which is really cool. Uh, and it, it's definitely a great thing because they need to have people who know their stuff, who know what's interesting and exciting to write about. Um, and yeah, and take that through to the episode um, with a lot of help from the editors. The editors are fantastic at Aeons as well. Um, and they really know how to sell a story, um, which is really great. Um, yeah, DK, I, I did um, uh, a very small project for them while I was in university. Um, so one of the other students um, said that they, they'd been in contact, but uh, they wanted a dinosaur person and di he was an invert guy. So dinosaurs weren't really his thing. And he said, here's this opportunity. Does anyone want it? And I went, oh, I'd like to do that. So I did that. Um, and then a few years later, they got back in contact with me on, on my Instagram, actually. Uh, they DM me saying, we have this other project. Um, uh, would you like to consult on it? And I was like, yes, that sounds fantastic. Um, that is so yeah. cool. That is awesome. So it, it, I love how young you is now fast forwarded to, to, and you are influencing the next generation. They're reading your items and yeah. reading your stories. So you are now putting a positive impact to the next gen already. That's so awesome. It's, it's crazy to think about, um, but yeah, it's, it's brilliant. If I can get kids interested in science um, or, or even stories, uh, that's also a really important thing. Um, um, yeah, there's, there's so much interesting stuff that right. I've had the opportunity to be involved with. So thank oh. you so much for taking the time to share what a, just wonderful adventures mm -hmm. and the great work you're doing. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you again and getting more into your research. I can't wait. Yeah, no problem. It's been, um, it's been really fun. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you kindly. Adios. Thanks.